Um, yeah, today I will talk about this minimal expansion, minimal and nearly minimal expansion in connected Niemandor groups. So I will begin with a couple of um, very interesting phenomena in additive combinatorics. Assume we have a, a reasonable notion of size in a group like, like this, some, some size, for example, like cardinality for finite size or higher measure for measurable size or Banach density, et cetera. So um, one would expect that if you choose AB like randomly, then the size of the product of AB should be much larger compared to the size of A and the size of B. And also the sequence set of A set of A square and A cube, the sequence grows rapidly. Um, so here are some examples. So in, in the integer setting, if A is chosen randomly of size N, then we expect that A plus A have size N choose two because we are choosing randomly. So you cannot have like, with hyperbility, you cannot have A plus B equals C plus D for four elements in A. And then A plus A plus A would have a size uh, N choose three. And also in a free group uh, generated by two element AB and we choose A as the generating set, then A to the power of N is just two to the power of N because all the possible like words are different. And then also in, um, in continuous settings, say SO3, and then we use higher measure, we consider this maximal torus TX, TY, TZ to be the um, rotation along the X axis, Y axis and Z axis and then because maximal torus have smaller dimension, that means it has mirror zero. But the product of them give you the, 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 the total group G, so the mirror of Tx times Ty times T, oh, is a type of Tx times Ty times Tz should be one. So this gives you like using higher mirror, even some mirror zero set could have large product mirror. Okay, so this is a, a interesting phenomenon, but, and also on the other hand, when a n grows much slower, slower or like a, a times b have smaller size, then we expect that a and g have some additive structure. So for example, also integers, if a is like, for example, in this case, a recent, a recent progression, then n a, which is n copies of a, the, the sum of n copy of a is just like 10 times n plus one. So it's pretty small. And also the second example is in T square, we are in an abelian group and then a is a strip in T square. So in this case, although A is a subset of T square, but actually A is controlled by this uh, one dimensional, one dimensional torus. So in this case, you can see T to the N is actually you just um, make the, the, the width of the strip larger and larger. So also the expansion of A to the N is also small. And similarly, when G is non abelian say G is SO3 times torus. So in this case, G is very non abelian but you can, see, you can see that if we take A to be SO3 times a strip in T, then basically A is controlled by this abelian structure. So that means in even in non-abelian group, you may have very small expansion in this case. Okay. And we are interested in characterizing the structure of size A with small expansion. And there are actually lots of celebrity results. So for example, a very famous result by Gromov says, so here S is a, finite generating set of G and um, S had polynomial growth. That means S to the power of N is controlled by N to the B, some polynomial of degree D. Then G is worth in the Newpotent, namely Newpotent, have Newpotent subgroup of finite index. So one, one can view Newpotent group as a natural generalization of abelian group. So in this case, it also tells you if G have a small expansion set, then in some sense, G should have some abelian structure, additive structure inside it. Okay. So this is something about structure of G. And then we also have some structure of A when like we A have small product set or some sets. So another very famous result in added combinatorics by Freeman, it says if A is a subset of integers of size N and A plus A smaller than three and minus four, then A is contained in an original progression of small size, of course. And then in a more general way, if A plus A is smaller than K times N, then A is contained in a generalized arithmetic progression with bounded size and bounded dimension. So that gives you a structure of A. So if A plus A is small or A plus B is small, then A and B itself should have lots of additive structure. And in this case, it's just a arithmetic progression. And the Freeman theorem is later generalized by Green and Rusha in 2007. And they show that if in this case, A is a subset of arbitrary abelian group, and a plus A have size at most K times A. And this implies that A, contain, a is contained in a small coset progression because we may have coset in this case. 
So coset progression is just coset plus a, a generalized arithm arithmetic progression. So by small means, we have bounded size and bounded dimension as zero. And the most recent one is a celebrated result by uh, Breda, Green, and Tau. So they prove that if ice is a K approximate group or I have ice have small tripling, as cube is smaller than KS, then ice can be covered by a small number of small coset progressions, coset new progressions. By small also means uh, bounded size and bounded dimension. Um, okay, so from this result, you can see that when A have small expansion, then not only G is controlled by some additive structure, but also A itself also has some additive, additive structure. Um, so actually I make, a, I make a table of all of these results. Um, so as we, as we discussed before, we are talking about size with small expansion. And here, uh, I hope you can see the mouse. So here it, it is a constant bounded dimension that is A times A or A plus A smaller than K times the size of A. And in discrete abelian case, we have a Freiman theorem that is, I just mentioned before, A plus A smaller than KA, then A is contained in a higher dimensional arithmetic progression. And the Green theorem for generalized uh, for all abelian group. And for continuous abelian setting, uh, that is when G is a topological locally compact abelian group. So in this case, I, um, I believe the result is folklore if you don't care about these sharp results. For example, I think it's not hard to translate Freeman's theorem into uh, d-dimensional torus or d-dimensional Euclidean space. Okay. And also for a uh, discrete non-abelian setting, the result is proved by Breda, Green, and Tau, as we just mentioned. And for continuous non-abelian setting, it is proved by Carolino in his thesis recently. So that is when mu a times a smaller than k times mu a, then a have some structure and g have some structure. So this is obtained by Carly. And we know that we, ha we have some results for small expansion set. So we, we may want to ask uh, how small can expansion be? So this is, we are asking the inequality. And this is also uh, known, for example, in discrete abelian case, we have cauchy Davenport uh, in ZP. And also it is generali gener generalized later by Kneezer, that is, um, a plus B is at least a set of A plus set of B minus set of H, where H is the largest subgroup. And the discrete abelian setting of Kneezer's, uh, of Kneezer's inequality here, as far as I know, is obtained by DeVos in 20, 2013 recently. And in the continuous setting, it's known as alpha plus beta inequality. And the abelian case is first proved by Kneezer in 1956 that mu a plus b is at least mu a plus mu b when mu a plus mu b is smaller than mu g, when g is compact. And um, in non abelian setting, it is obtained by Kemperman, the same inequality, mu a times b at least mu a plus mu b. I will mention this later, talk about it later. Um, and then we have this, once we have this inequality, we want to ask when will the equality hold in these inequalities. So minimal expansion set, characterization of minimal expansion sets. And we are expecting that here the structure is better than the small expansion set, general small expansion set. And, and lots of celebrity results here, for example, Wolsper, Wolsper theorem says, if cauchy Davenport inequality, the equality holds in ZP, then both A and B are a reasonable progression of same common difference. Okay, and also the generalized result is obtained by the celebrated results by Kamperman in the 1960s. For the continuous abelian setting, it is obtained by Kneezer. So A, B are board sets. I will mention this, I will talk about this later. And for discrete non-abelian setting, it's obtained by the same paper by DeVos, generalizing the uh, Kamperman's results for abelian setting. And also, for near minimal, nearly minimal expansion, that is when the equality almost hold, for example, like mu a plus a almost 2a, like 2 plus delta a. And in this case, for abelian case, there are lots of results. For example, Freeman 3k minus 4 theorem, right, for, for z. And then also later, Freeman generalized these Wolfsburg results to when a plus a smaller than, I remember it's 2.4 times a by some like number strictly smaller than three. And then 
a couple of results is obtained in this in this case. And very recently, I think maybe this month, so there's an ARCA paper by Lev. He proved a sharp result for a cyclic group. So it's a very nice result. And for continuous abelian setting, that is a inverse theorem of the Knizia's inequality. So the inequality is first obtained by, by Tao for a compact case in 2018. So his result is about, um, okay. So if you consider this near minimal expansion, we, let's assume A equal to B. So in this case, we have mu A squared or mu A plus A smaller than two plus delta mu A. So Tau's result only works for when delta equal to little of one. So it's far away from being sharp. And the result is later generalized by Grismer to non-compact group and disconnected group. Um, and his proof used non-standard analysis in a very essential way. So it, it is also uh, a qualitative result. And um, a, a better bound is obtained recently by Christ and Iliopolo. So their result is, um, for example, in A plus B, they prove the inverse theorem for mu A squared smaller than two plus C times mu A for some constant C. So the result is, is nearly sharp up to a constant factor. It's kind of have the same magnitude. And for discrete non-abelian setting, the inverse theorem, I believe it is unknown. So it seems like all the current, current method doesn't work for this case, uh, at least to me. Um, yes. And also, uh, and, okay, and our results basically proved the minimal expansion and nearly minimal expansion case in the continuous non-abelian setting. So I will talk about, I will give a, a precise statement of, this, uh, of our theorem later. Okay, and this is our, the background of the, of the problem. Okay, and then in this talk, we'll focus on this continuous extremal problem. So in this talk, G will be always a, a locally compact group. So G have a higher mirror. And we say G is unimodular if the left higher mirror is also a right higher mirror. And Kamperman proved the following inequality as I mentioned before. So if A, B have our compact subsets, and AB, both of them have positive mirror, and AB are small. For example, we don't want mu A plus mu B larger than mu G. And this makes sense when G is compact because we can use normalized higher mirror, mu G has mirror one. And in this, under this assumption, we have mu AB is at least mu A plus mu B. So this is a, a very nice inequality. And then also in the same paper, he, he asked the following question, when does the equality hold? So can, what can we say about A and AB and G if you know equality holds? Okay, so there is a obvious candidate, namely parallel board sets. So assuming there is a continuous surjective homomorphism mapping from G to one dimensional torus. Let's say torus, we can assume G is compact in this talk. And then we choose two compact intervals I and J inside this one dimensional torus and both A and B are just pullback of these two intervals. And we know that um, in this one dimensional torus interval have small expansion. And then by, so pullback of this interval by, by using the same character, basically AB is controlled by this one dimensional torus. So it also have very small expansion, okay? And actually Kinesar proved in 1956 that these all BVS candidates are the only ones when G is abelian. So if I have equal, equality holding abelian case, both A and B are board sets, parallel board sets. They share the same character and uh, recently, CRISMR uh, generalized its results to disconnected case. Okay. And we can also ask if there exist some stability results, that is when the equality almost hold, can we, what can we say about A and B? Um, in particular, so there's a conjecture asked by Tal and Grismer that must each solution of near extremal problem be close to a solution of extremal problem. That is, do we have a stability result? And the structure of A and B, we also have some obvious candidates. We know that when equality hold, we have board sets. So in this near equality version, we can define this epsilon near board set. It's just some set very close to board set. And similarly, these sets are controlled by, by one dimensional torus, so it has small expansion. And it is proved by Tao in 2018 that this is, this is the case when G is abelian and compact. And this is, is, is generalized later by Grismer to disconnected and non-compact group, abelian group. Okay. 
um, our first result basically answers the question asked by Kemperman. So the equality case. So in this talk, we say two sets AB have minimal expansion or minimally expanding if mu AB is equal to mu A plus mu B. And we also ex exclude the, the trivial case when mu, uh, we, we, we require mu A and mu B have positive measure and mu A plus mu B is smaller than mu G, especially when G is compact. And so we prove that, um, so actually when G is compact, connected compact group, um, a, B, B compact subsets, and if equality holds in Kempermann's inequality, then A, B are parallel board sets. Um, actually, our results also hold for non-compact group, but in this talk, we will just focus on compact setting to make, make our life easier. So this answer a question asked by Kempermann. And one more thing I want to mention that, uh, so this connected is essential, because if G is not connected, we can just choose A and B to be an open subgroup of G. In that case, A, B have, have trivial expansion. A times B is just A. So we, we don't have Kempermann inequality. And also we require, okay, this is compact, so it is unimodular. For a locally compact case, we require G to be unimodular. That is when G is not unimodular, A times B might be very close to A. So Kempermann inequality is not true there. Okay, so this is for the equality case. And we can also define delta minimal expansion. So if a, mu a b is smaller than mu a plus mu b plus delta. And we also obtain the inverse theorem for this case when G is a connected unimodular group. Okay, so in a statement, I wrote compact group. So a b b subsets of G, marable subsets or compact subsets, and a b is delta near the minimal expansion. That is, you have this equality smaller than mu a plus mu b plus delta. If and only if, a, B are epsilon near parallel board sets. And moreover, our dependence between epsilon and delta are linear. Um, okay, so if you went, if you attended my previous talk in Warwick Computer Seminar, or if you look at my ARCA paper, so actually in the paper, epsilon and delta is not linear, it is quadratic. So you require delta to be epsilon square. So that's a weaker result. And recently, when we just tried to polish the paper, we realized by pushing our uh, method further, we can get this linear bound. And this is actually best possible up, up to a constant factor. Because um, one can think like epsilon to be the minimum among mu a and mu b. And then when delta equal to mu a, say mu a equal to mu b, and this is a 3k minus 4 theorem. And if you have uh, equality here, delta equal to mu a, then the result doesn't hold. Because even in abelian case, a could be a union of two interval, uh, two disjoint interval, and that is not a board set. Okay, and um, okay, one more thing is, so here our result is ABR parallel board sets, but when G is not abelian, board set not only give you the structure of the size A and B, it also give you structure of G because not all group have this homomorphism matching to torus, right? And then using this observation and pushing the method forward, uh, we can prove the following corollary. This can be viewed as a minor expansion gap results for general simple Lie groups. So if you have a simple Lie group, a compact Lie group, and A is a sufficiently small size, then A squared should be at least two plus C times mu A. So there is a gap. That is the Kempermann inequality cannot hold here. And actually we can prove, we can get a quantitative bound of C. So I remember in the proof, C can be taken like one or 100, something like that. Okay. Um, okay, so any questions about the statement? Okay. Okay, so if there's no question, I'm talk about I will talk about uh, the idea of the proof. Um, so the proof use uh, use some geometry. Um, okay. So firstly, in all the previous approach. Uh, of this problem uh, for the abelian setting, the, the main method are basically by uh, the E transform used by Knizer in his uh, inverse theorem of, of the equality case in abelian setting, and also by, by Griezmann and Tau free analysis. And we think, um, so the main difficulty of this problem is to construct a homomorphism mapping from G to the torus. And we believe that in non-abelian case, both of these two methods are pretty difficult to generalize 
for example, for the e-transform, it uses Abelian uh, property in a very critical way. And for free analysis, if you want to generalize to non-Abelian setting, you need uh, some representation theory. And we believe um, at least it's, it is pretty hard to, um, to use representation theory in non-complex setting. But actually in our proof, in our geometric approach, uh, non-complex setting is actually easier than complex case. So that is actually very surprising to us at the beginning, because at the beginning, I thought a compact group is easier than non-compact group. But here, actually, non-compact is slightly easier. And the reason is actually not, um, not, not difficult, because in the proof, we use this induction dimension. So we want to find a suitable subgroup of G, have lower dimension, and then we apply induction. When the group is non-compact, we are hoping to find a non-compact subgroup H. But for non-compact group, we will always have compromise inequality, right? In a non-compact group, mu a times b is always larger than mu a plus mu b. But if g is compact, we may have trouble. Because although maybe we can assume a, b have small measure, but the a intersects some group h may have large intersection. That is, a intersect h and b intersect h in total might be larger than the measure of h. So in that case, we don't have inequality. So it's hard to apply it actually. So that's, that's one of the difficulty. Okay, so back to the geometric idea. So the main, in order to overcome this difficulty, basically we use a geometric control to get this homomorphism. So the idea actually comes from the inverse theorem of, uh, of the Brimakowski inequality. So in Brimakowski inequality, we know that axiomal structure are convex sets. So I'm thinking we may have the same, same phenomenon for, for general group. For example, in this case, like t g equal to torus square, t square. And then this gray rectangle, it just group g. And then we just consider a coset decomposition. So each vertical line, so the vertical line is, um, is h, and horizontal line is g quotient h. And each vertical line is a coset of h. It's some like a times h. So we can decompose, uh, we can decompose g at this rectangle. And we can see that under this coset decomposition, if A looks like a square, if A looks like a small square, then, okay, A square may, might be really weird, right? But the best we can imagine, we can, we can expect is, so the diameter of square get doubled. So if the diameter of the square of A is small, and in this case, we can say the expansion of A is, how about this factor to four? So it's not have factor of two. But if you have this small strip, if A looks like a small strip, then A square is basically the best case we can have is we just double the width of the strip and then the, the measure of A get doubled. So basically we believe when A square is small, A should have a nice geometric structure. So this is our general intuition. I also draw a nice picture to help you uh, understand the geometry in intuition because when I talk to my um, my friends say working in non commutative geometry. When I say I use a geometry control, they always, they always think I use some like geodesic curve or some Riemann manifold stuff. So that's not the case actually. So here uh, we do use a uh, key prop geometric property of G. We do require G to be a Lie group. So actually in the first step of the proof, we translate the problem into Lie groups because we want to use some uh, nice Lie algebra property of, of the group. Um, but here, actually, we don't really care about the geometry of, uh, of A inside G. So inside G, A may look like arbitrary. So A is just an arbitrary set. And then the key, okay, the key idea we want to use is we, we manage to find a, a subgroup H, a closed subgroup H, such that under this coset decomposition, remember this coset decomposition, so G, uh, the set A behaves nicely. It almost looks like a strip. And also we require A is behave rigidly under translation. That is, if we translate A by a small element, small means some element inside a small neighborhood of identity. So we translate A by a small distance, then the geometric shape of A, so under this coset decomposition, stay unchanged. So this is our, our hope. And then if that's the case, then if A behave rigidly, then we can choose a generic fiber by fiber, we just means a coset of A intersect with A. And then we can apply induction dimension. By induction hypothesis, we can map this fiber into a torus. 
And then in Taurus, we can moni monitor the intersection of this A and GA. So GA is some translation of A by some small element. And then, so the blue part intersection is, is a translation of some set of S by, by some element inside the one-dimensional torus, which denote by psi of A. And for GA, it's, it is translated by psi G inverse of A. And then we can we consider the distance between psi A and psi, uh, uh, okay. For in general, for G1, G2, we monitor the, the distance between psi G1A and psi, psi G2 inverse A inside torus. So this norm means the closest distance to the nearest, uh, the distance to the nearest integer, okay? And also inside G, we can also define a pseudo metric by D G1, G2 to be uh, the measure of G1A minus G2A. And then one of the key properties, if you choose H nicely, so actually this D G1, G2A and this delta G1, G2A are the same. And then if they are the same, it will give us, you know, because this delta G1, G2 is basically controlled by the one dimensional torus. That gives us this pseudo metric is controlled by one dimensional torus. So it tells you this translation G1, G2 can only translate into two directions because torus have only two directions up and down, right? If you consider like translating by a small distance. And then this will give us a homomorphism mapping to torus. And also in general, we hope that when A have small expansion, A squared smaller than KA, uh, maybe A doesn't look like a strip, but A have looks like a, some other geometric structure. And under this translation, A behave rigidly. And this geometric structure encode this group homomorphism. I mean, this is a hope for general K. So here we focus on K is close to two. Okay. So, um, okay, overview. So in this proof overview, we will just assume G is a connected compact group. And AB are compact subsets of G, and AB have nearly minimal expansion. That is, um, mu AB is smaller than mu A plus mu B plus delta for some delta. And our goal is, as I said, as I said before, we want to construct a correct homomorphism into one dimensional torus. Uh, step zero. The first step, we use a probabilistic argument and a key submodularity -mod inequality, I think it is due to Lucia, uh, to make A, B to have arbitrary small measure. So this submodularity uh, sub inequality by Lucia is used by Lucia in his proof of, in his new proof of Kinesar's inequality. And also this uh, key inequality is also used by Tao in his proof of inverse theorem of the Abelian case. So in the first case, basically, we want to arrange AB to have small measure, okay? And in step one, we are trying to redu reduce the problem to Lie groups. Why? Um, so actually, although we didn't really use a proof uh, used by Breda, Green, and Tao in the approximate uh, group proof, but actually um, our proof is inspired by their proof. Because imagine in the, in the general approximate group structure, um, we don't have too much information about G. So in their proof, basically in the first step, they apply Hushatsky Lee model theorem to reduce the problem to uh, Lee groups and then use geometric property of Lee groups. Uh, they use uh, the Gleason uh, escape norms and also the Bray-Minkowski for Newton Lee groups to, up to get the control on the, on, the, on the geometric shape of the sets. So here, Although we use a different approach and our approach is more quantitative, but we also want to uh, reduce the problem into Lie group, Lie groups. Also our approach is not as general as their approach, um, but it is more uh, quantitative and which is enough for our approach. So in the first step, we want to um, use a refined gleason yamabe theorem. So gleason yamabe theorem says any locally compact group is actually an inverse limit of the Lie groups. So actually there are lots of different uh, homomorphism mapping this group to Lie group. And we want to choose the correct one, the correct homomorphism such that the Lie group have certain property, I will mention it, uh, I will talk about it later, and of boundary dimension. And then in the second step, uh, we want to show that under some certain assumption, the near minimal expansion conditions can be passed into Lie groups. So in the original group, you have mu AB smaller than mu A plus mu B plus delta. And then in this Lie group, we want to find some like mu A prime 
mu a prime b prime smaller than mu a prime plus mu b prime plus delta prime. And delta prime is like 100 delta, something like that. And a prime and a have same comparable size. So this is, uh, this is the goal of step 1b. And the second step, we want to find a, a a induced pseudo metric. So this is the key step. So why we want to construct a pseudo metric? So the reason is, um, okay, actually I will, I, I, I will talk about this later. Basically in general, if you have a homomorphism, if you already have a homomorphism mapping G from a small group, from small metric group, then by pullback from the metric of the small group, you, you naturally have a pseudo metric in a large group. So that is, we hope that if you can construct a pseudo metric with some nice property, this pseudo metric will give you the homomorphism. So this is our hope. Um, so in the first step, we want to choose a subgroup H. So remember in the, in the, in the picture I drew before, I want to prove there exists a group subgroup H, closed subgroup H, such that you have a nice cosine decomposition. So here we want to choose a, a nice, uh, um, a nice subgroup. So this, this step is actually pretty hard. So because we prove that if you, if you cannot choose such group H, then A behaves like a Kakea set. But Kakea means, okay, again, there's nothing about ge geodesic curve. It just, uh, okay. So inside the Lie group, we can view that all the maximal torus as a different vector, different uh, directions. And then if A contains a coset of all maximal torus, then A behaves like a Kakea set. So in this case, we just view A as like some Kakea property. And then basically here we prove that A cannot have both the Kakea property and also small expansion property. And then because A have small expansion, such so, so that we can, we can choose this closed subgroup A with some nice short fiber property. And in the next step, which is uh, uh, one of the critical step, very important step, we basically proved under some this this H cosine decomposition, most of fibers behave uniformly. So A behaves like a strip, and also the translation of A behave rigidly. So translation doesn't change the shape of A under this cosine decomposition. And the third step, we need to construct a core. So we're going to construct a very small set A prime with with uh, arbitrary small measure and similar expansion as A, and also similar shape as A. And we, we will use this core of A to control the error. So this is in spirit very similar as the sanders crude c sachs theory. But actually, um, I mean, our, our result is not as general as that theory, but have a better quantitative bound. So this result only work for expansion very close to. So this is very important because uh, once we construct this local um, pseudo metric, we need to extend this pseudo metric to the whole group. And by doing this, we need to control the error. And the error term may blow up. So in order to control the error, we use this core. So each time we extend our uh, pseudo metric, we just go back to compare with the core to um, control the error. Okay. And by using these three steps, we are able to obtain this uh, pseudo metric. And the last step is from pseudo-metric, we want to get a homomorphism and get the structures of A, A and B. So firstly, using the pseudo-metric, we can construct a multi-valued almost homomorphism. So multi-valued means it, it is not a function, it's just a relation. It is multi-valued because um, for every element in G, we represent G as a product of small element, of some element in a small neighborhood of, of, uh, uh, of identity. But this small neighborhood, uh, I mean, this representation is not unique. So although we can control the error, but, but this is a multivalue function, it, it is not a function. And then from this multivalue almost homomorphism, we use this, um, this measurable selection theorem from descriptive set theory to choose a universal almost homomorphism for all elements in G. And then we use a, a grove carter rock theorem for in Riemann geometry uh, and this theorem allow us to get a homomorphism from the almost homomorphism. And this is also another reason why we want to reduce the problem to Lie groups because this, is, this theorem doesn't hold for a general group, general topological group, only works for Lie group. And then we can obtain this homomorphism. 
And then we can use uh, automatic continuity theorem from discrete beset theory to show that this, uh, this homomorphism is actually surjective and continuous. Okay. And once we have this homomorphism, we can again choose H, our H as a kernel of this homomorphism and apply the step two again and use, use the induction dimension to get the structure of A and B. Okay. So this is the um, steps we use. So basically we get this idea from this uh, geometry. By geometry, we mean a uh, coset decomposition. So as I mentioned, the reason we use uh, pseudometric because we believe a nice pseudometric encode a nice homo group homomorphism. So we call it pseudometric on X is a function satisfy this these three conditions like DA equal to zero for OA and symmetric, symmetry DAB equal to DPA and also triangle inequality. So different between pseudometric and metric is we don't have like DAB equal to zero if A equal to B, we don't have that. And we, in, we consider this left invariant pseudometric that is uh, if you translate two element by some element on the left then the distance stay unchanged. Um, yeah, as I mentioned before, a natural situation here when there is a pseudometric is when we have a continuous group homomorphism into a metric group. And then the pseudometric can be viewed as a pullback of a metric in, the, in this metric group. So that's the main reason we, we use this, uh, we try to construct this pseudometric. And we call a pseudometric is locally linear uh, for some radius rho. So we first consider G1, G2, such that G1, G2 is bounded by rho. For, for all of those elements, we say th this element is small. So those elements are in a small neighborhood of identity in some sense. And then we say this uh, metric is linear if all, for all these small elements, we have G1, G3, it's either G1, G2 plus G2, G3 or G1, G2 minus G2, G3. So if a uh, metric is linear, you can see that you can view that all the three points lie in a, a, in a straight line. So one point is lying in the middle. So under this assumption, you can see the distance between two points is either the sum of the other two distances or the, the difference of the other distance because all of these points are in a line. Um, okay, so in the near equality case, we can define something like uh, almost locally linear, something like this. And then we can show the following proposition that if we can construct a, a pseudo metric, which is actually almost locally linear, or say in this proposition, just locally linear equality case, then, then actually we can, we can find the homomorphism mapping from G to torus. So basically this linearity property also enco already encode the homomorphism mapping to torus. Okay. So in order to control, in order to construct this uh, nice linear pseudometric, we have to control the shape of it. Okay. And also actually the pseudometric defined in this paper is just G1, G2 to be mu A minus G1 A intersect G2 A. And then we can, we can see easily that this is a left invariant pseudometric because A is less, trans, uh, the mu A is left translation invariant. Okay. And the next idea is, um, so I've been told in, in, in the talk, I should present at least a proof. So here I will present a very nice, short and interesting, and interesting proof. Um, actually in the proof, uh, in the paper, we obtain uh, many new proof of compromise inequality. And each of new proof will give us some structure result when the equality holds. So here I will present a new proof of compromise inequality. Um, yes, so in this step, we want to reassume um, we assume we already have an H and A intersect all the AH, all the cosets of H and B intersect all the cosets HB is small. And as I said before, this is really hard um, to opt uh, to get this condition, but we, we, we are able to, eventually we are able to get this condition. So we just assume you have this. And then we, we, are, uh, we want to prove our A looks like some set like A looks like, uh, okay, because here we want to prove some fiber wise information by fiber, we mean A intersect each cosets. So we want to prove that all the cosets or almost all the cosets of A have same length. So that is already give you some structure. 
because we know that um, so the gray part is a translation of a GA. So if you know that all the fiber have the same length, and also you know that intersection of A and G is also um, have small expansion, so all the fiber should also have the same length. So you can already have a, a rough geometric structure. Okay. So although this picture is, is eventually we can prove this cannot happen. So when we translate A by GA, so it should behave rigidly instead of like this. Uh, but in this step, we, we want to prove all the fiber looks similar. So the key assumption is all the fiber are small. And know that knowing that uh, we assume A, B are compact, although when G is non-compact, G, uh, non G quotient H may not be compact, but the, project, uh, the projection of B is compact on G quotient H. So we, def we can define a uniform probability measure on this projection of B. Okay, and once we define this measure, we want to approximate A times B by only the set of A times a fiber, uh, one of the coset of B to approximate A times B. Okay, so the proof is actually, uh, in this case, is uh, very short and easy and very interesting, I, I believe. With loss of generality, we can assume the projection of A is larger than the projection of B. And then we choose a, a fiber in B intersect HB uniformly at random using the probability measure we just constructed before. And then the expectation of the length of the fiber is just mu B over the, the size of the projective of B, mu HB. Okay. And then we know that mu AB is at least mu A times of one fiber. And we can take the expectation because we choose this fiber uniformly at random. And then using quotient integral formula, we can decompose A into A intersect XH for different fibers. We can decompose A into a sum of all fibers. And then in the next step, we can apply compromise inequality on these two fibers and apply Fubini theorem. So by using compromise inequality, A intersect H, XH times B intersect HB is at least A inter intersect XH plus B intersect HB. So we have this sum. And then the first term is at least mu A because it's just equal to mu A actually. And the second term, because the project, uh, I mean the projection have size mu A H. The second term have size uh, mu B over mu HB times mu A H because we assume mu A H is at least mu HB. So this is at least mu B. So if you assume compromise inequality in lower dimensional group in H, then we can prove a compromise inequality for a larger group H. So actually, this is a new proof of compromise inequality uh, using this induction method, induction dimension. And actually, this new proof is indeed very, very important, uh, very, very useful. Because once we know that equality holds for, for this case, we can see uh, we can have lots of information. For example, equality should hold for H, right? In this compromise inequality for this small dimensional group, equality also holds. And also, a random fiber should have the same length as the expectation. So we actually have lots of property. So for example, um, um, yeah, like the second one for almost all fiber, the intersection of being uh, of the cosine should have the same length. Okay. And also fiber wise, you have lower dimensional uh, minimal expansion. And then we are able to apply this induction because we basically deal with a problem from G to H. And we can also manage to prove AH equal to HB, right? Because here, this term is mu B over mu HB times mu AH. Because we have equality, so mu AH equal to mu HB. So A and B have the same projection. And actually, from this geometry, we can also prove mu AH equal to mu HB equal to the all G quotient H in the compact case, equality case. In the inequality case, nearly minimal expansion, we have different behavior. So we, we have to use a more complicated uh, proof. And this is not true. Uh, but let's just focus on the easy case, the equality case. So the reason is actually easy. So if you have A, assuming AH is not full G quotient A, the projection is not full, then by using probability argument, you can manage translation. You can find a G such that A and GA uh, have um, non-trivial symmetric difference in G quotient H in the projection. And then you can consider the length of the fiber 
because we know that G A union GA also have the same, also have small expansion. So all the fibers should have similar length. But here we can see that this fiber have uh, longer length than this one. Okay. Okay, uh, again, this argument only works for equality case. It doesn't work for for inequality case. Actually, inequality case, we don't have AH equal to one or we don't even have AH is large. So we have to use a different argument. Okay, so I don't have time for this. Um, maybe I'll just mention some ongoing work. So what can be said when mu a square smaller than k mu a for some constant k? So if you are familiar with Brita green toss result on the structure of a Proctor group, you may hope that something like um, maybe G is, G is virtually Newpotent, something like that, right? Because in the discrete case, we have, we have something like Newpotent group. But actually that is not the case for, for the continuous setting because we have this Brimikowski phenomenon. Even for a simple group, we can choose a small neighborhood of identity. Then the expansion of A should be small. Right, because we have this, uh, I mean, you can choose a small neighborhood in Lie algebra. So you can see them some small expansion in, in even in simple Lie group, which is not new potent. And actually this uh, answer, is, this question is answered qualitatively by Carlino. Said there must be a group homomorphism mapping from G to a Lie group of bounded dimension. But his proof using the method developed by BGT and Hrushaski Lie model theory, which is not quantitative is only a qualitative results. And by pushing our method further, as I said, like small expansion means A have some geometric structure, different geometric structure and also under translation behave rigidly. So in a joint work with, um, also with my friend Chu Ming Chuan, my collaborator, and also Ri Xiang Zhang, a homogenic analysis, we obtain a quantitative proof of this result. So we can, de we can determine the exact dimension of, of, of this of this number. Okay. Uh, okay. So I'll stop here.